All right, well, uh, hello everybody. It's Professor B. I am going to record this lecture. It's not going to be nearly as much fun as the classroom, and I'll try to keep it uh, short and sweet. But I do want to make sure that you have the information you need for your uh, exam one. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the chapter we are reviewing today is chapter five, and it's on microbial control. We spent the last two lectures talking about how bacteria grow and what we can do to promote their growth and make them grow, different things that they need in order to grow. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how to control them. Microbial control has become a really important topic, particularly in the healthcare field, because, uh, because of the... Uh, uh, ACA or the Affordable Care Act. The ACA, part of the funding for the ACA, for, which is Obamacare, if you don't know what that is. So we have the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. Those are the same thing. And when that was introduced, part of the money-saving procedures of that were some changes to Medicare and Medicaid. And one of those major uh, uh, money-saving changes was that if a nosocomial infection were to occur, with a patient, which is a, an inf a hospital acquired infection, an infection that a patient gets because they were staying in the hospital. If a patient has a, what's deemed to be or determined to be a nosocomial infection, then the hospital cannot charge Medicare or Medicaid for it. They will not pay for the treatment of that infection and the hospital also by law cannot charge the patient. So hospitals are now having to absorb or eat the cost of treating a pneumonia or UTI or any kind of nosocomial infection. They have to pay for the cost of that treatment. Because of that, hospitals and healthcare facilities have become much more diligent in trying to prevent nosocomial infections. It's in their financial interest and, of course, ultimately in the patient and doctor's and, and healthcare facilities' interest to prevent uh, nosocomial infections. So I just wanted to introduce that because that is an important, one of the reasons that microbial control is really important. And since most of you are going to be moving into the healthcare field, it's going to kind of, you're going to hear about it quite a bit. You're going to have to take complete classes on nothing but microbial control. All right, so let's get started here. Terminology. Uh, in disinfecting or cleaning, uh, sterilization, um, aseptic, antiseptic, sanitization, all of these different terms are really important to differentiate. So I have them in little boxes here to try and make it a little easier to see them as separate entities. They all revolve around the concept of a disinfectant. And a disinfectant is a chemical, it can be toxic or not necessarily be toxic, but it, um, it is toxic to microorganisms. Some disinfectants are more effective than others, but all of the other terms really all revolve around the center box here, uh, really revolve around the term disinfectant, which is just basically a compound that's going to harm or destroy a bacteria. An antiseptic is a disinfectant that's non-toxic. That's one that can be used on skin. So betadine, hydrogen peroxide, those sorts of things. Aseptic is just simply a procedure we use. Um, it's not really a chemical, it's just a procedure that's used to prevent contamination of a disinfected area. I'm going to move over to pasteurization. Pasteurization is a form of treatment that is used to reduce the number of microorganisms that may cause spoilage in food. Think milk, pasteurization of milk. Um, or to prevent or kill pathogens that may cause disease. And just so you know, pasteurization was not initially, Louis Pasteur did not create pasteurization for milk. He created pasteurization to prevent the spoiling of beer and wine. So Louis is still one of my favorite scientists. Now, sterilization is the process that we use to achieve a sterile environment. And a sterile environment is one in which zero microorganisms exist, no viruses, uh, no bacteria, no fungi, no spores, no endospores, nothing nothing exists in a sterile environment. So sterilization is the process we use to achieve a sterile environment. And of course, we just define sterile, so that's an easy one. And then we have the idea of preservation. Preservation, we don't necessarily kill bacteria. I mean, we're going to have to disinfect or sterilize, uh, destroy bacteria in a, 
a food situation. But in preservation, what we're really doing is setting up an environment that will inhibit or prevent the growth of microorganisms in the future. All right, the last here is uh, I want to talk about bacteria static. A bacteria static is a type of disinfectant that is going to inhibit bacterial growth, but it does not directly kill it. So bacteria may survive in the presence of a bacteria static disinfectant, uh, but is not going to be able to increase in population, which in ultimately or indirectly is going to result in death of the microorganism. A bactericidal, on the other hand, in the top right corner here, the bactericidal, on the other hand, will directly kill the microorganism. So they are a little bit different. The difference between them is not as big of a deal in disinfecting, where the whole idea is to get rid of the bacteria. But those two terms are, are going to come back when we study antibiotics. And when we move into antibiotics, which are not the same as disinfectants, when we move into the antibiotic uh, portion of the course, we're going to see there is a big difference between a bactericidal and a bacteriostatic. So knowing those definitions will be helpful. All right, a little bit of history here. Joseph Lister. Joseph Lister introduced the idea of sterilizing equipment long, bef um, long before anybody else. And he actually created a wound cleanser made out of carbolic acid. And uh, it was used to clean both wounds and surgical equipment. So Lister is kind of the, the mac daddy of, a, of antisepsis. And he also introduced the idea of aseptic technique. So Lister was way ahead of the game. And he was saying, he was basically saying, look, we have got to find a way to get rid of microorganisms. They are here. They are causing infection. They're, they're causing problems. And he came up with a chemical method as well as an actual surgical method to help prevent infection. Later, in uh, somewhere in the 1920s, Robert Johnson, the founder of Johnson & Johnson, named Listerine after uh, Joseph Lister. And that was his way. He introduced Listerine as an uh, antiseptic before it was ever uh, listed as a mouthwash. Now, other principles control of control include disinfection, where with disinfecting, we're going to eliminate pathogens in particular. Not every microorganism that's on the surface of something is necessarily a pathogen. Not all bacteria cause disease. So disinfection is looking specifically at pathogenic bacteria, organisms that are going to, going to cause some kind of human disease. Uh, most often they are chemicals that have, they are going to be some kind of chemical form and they're going to have some kind of antimicrobial activity. An a surface or an area that is disinfected is not the same as sterile. There are still going to be microorganisms there. Many disinfectants don't work very well against um, endospores, so there could still possibly be some forms of uh, organisms in the area that has been disinfected. Now, the different forms of disinfectant, different disinfecting includes actual disinfectants themselves, chemicals for removing microorganisms, and then uh, like a bactericide, viricide, fungicide. They're just named after what they destroy. The other is the antiseptic. And antiseptics are antimicrobial compounds, again, that are safe enough to use on skin. These are your betadines, iodines, hydrogen peroxide, soap and water, uh, triclosan type soaps. Triclosan is a disinfectant that's put in um, dish soaps and hand soaps and those sorts of things. Both disinfectants and antiseptics can be either bactericidal or bacteriostatic. So that's something to keep in mind. Preservation. How do we preserve milk? Why do we use preservation methods? And what's the, what's the point behind them? So, of course, it's because we want to keep our perishable foods uh, uh, safe and we want to keep them good. So we keep milk in the refrigerator. We pasteurize it. We wash our vegetables. We pickle or can or... Uh, dry or, or even smoked foods. These are all different methods of preservation that have been created in order to uh, preserve perishables. Okay. All right. So another form or uh, principle of control is the idea of decontamination, reducing the pathogen population. And methods of decontamination really include washing and sanitizing. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're removing pathogens, any microorganisms that could possibly make us sick. 
One thing to keep in mind, hand washing with soap and water to this day, no matter how many new decontaminants or sanitizers or anything else we have out there, washing your hands with soap and water and rinsing them off uh, is still the number one way to inhibit that. So when we um, are trying to disinfect things, we have to look at what we're going to use and when are we going to use that. So different situations are going to call for different types of microbial control. Daily life, we look at sanitization and decontamination all the time. Washing your hands, washing your clothes, cleaning your kitchen, uh, cleaning your bathroom. You're not using high-level sterilants and cold sterilants to clean those areas. You're using just your basic everyday disinfectants. But if you're in a hospital or a healthcare facility, on top of sanitizing and disinfecting in common areas and maybe in a general patient's room, a general patient's room is going to be cleaned differently than a surgical suite. In a surgical suite, sterilization is required. Uh, going from patient to patient that don't necessarily have infections or anything, they may they don't have any kind of microbial disease, you may use a hand sanitizer going from room to room and patient to patient. But if you're working in the ICU, you're going to have to wash your hands with soap and water more often. Or if you're in a, um, if you're a surgical nurse, you're going to be putting, you're going to be assisting surgeons in washing their hands. They don't just come in and wash their hands with soap and water like they just went to the bathroom. There's a whole procedure and uh, steps that have to be taken in order to ensure that their hands are sterile before they put on sterile gloves. So a uh, sterile environment is very important in a hospital setting. In the laboratory, we use sterilization and disinfectants. Again, sterilization is really because we want to make sure that we don't introduce any kind of contamination into our cultures so we can ensure that when we run our tests that the bacteria we are, we are testing is giving us the result that we're seeing. Disinfectant is basically cleaning surfaces, equipment, those sorts of things. And food facilities. Food facilities, uh, disinfecting is important. Of course, sanitization is going to be uh, uh, necessary. In a food facility, they may not be able to get rid of every single microorganism, but they certainly need to be able to get rid of pathogens. Uh, here in the U.S., we are lucky enough to have the USDA and the FDA and all of these different types of inspecting agencies and government ag agencies that all ensure that our, our food chain and our food sources are safe. Uh, water treatment facilities worry about disinfecting and they run tests on a regular basis. You're going to run a uh, what's called an EMB test next week in the lab and that's a common environmental water test uh, type media. One of the things to keep in mind and understand are what are called biosafety levels. Now the BSLs are determined by the CDC and they run from top to bottom lowest hazard to greatest hazard. Now the lowest hazard is a BSL-1. Those are your basic laboratories, high schools, those sorts of things. Uh, they don't necessarily cause any kind of known disease in humans. Uh, they're sometimes even probiotic or beneficial. BSL-2 organisms have somewhat of a risk. They're sometimes referred to as opportunistic pathogens. Uh, if they're part of our human flora, they can be passed. Um, they do vary in their severity, but there's usually a treatment or a cure for a BSL-2. Uh, really, the BSL level is based more on the risk of the organism. How easily transmissible is it? So BSL-2 organisms are not particularly um, easy, easily transmitted. Then we have BSL-3. BSL-3 organisms are exotic. exotic. They're coming from other areas. They're outside. Uh, they are oftentimes easily transmitted primarily through aerosol transmission. So these are airborne bacteria or airborne viruses. Uh, they are very serious diseases and they can uh, cause uh, potentially a life-threatening type of situation or infection. Then we have um, BSL-4s. BSL-4s are very dangerous and exotic. They're very rare diseases. We don't see them a whole lot. They are super high risk, very easily transmissible, and always cause some type of life-threatening disease. Examples of a BSL-4, B, I'm sorry, BSL-4, Marburg, Lassa fever, um, a chupo virus, Ebola. These are all uh, hemorrhagic viruses. So you can see on the on the left there, we've got our, our definitions of our BSLs. 
our biosafety levels. On the right, we have our potential hazard, of course, lowest to highest. One thing I want you to remember about BS, a difference between BSL-3s and BSL-4s, BSL-3 uh, pathogens very often have a form of treatment and also very often actually have a cure. BSL-4 organisms, we can treat them, they can be treated uh, symptomatically, but actually curing the disease has not really quite, a cure is not always discovered. We can just maybe provide supportive treatment to a patient to make sure that they are strong enough to survive the disease and to support their immune system to get over it. The only one that may be an exception there would be Ebola. They did discover in that last Ebola outbreak that they can give antibody treatments uh, to people with Ebola and help speed up the recovery. So uh, Ebola is not necessarily curable, but it is treatable. So who are you trying to get rid of? What type of organism are you trying to uh, destroy? Uh, endospores are the most difficult, aside from prions, endospores are the most difficult form of microorganism to try and get rid of. Uh, it requires a, a very high heat. Uh, endospores are destroyed with autoclaving because of the steam under pressure, but it requires extremely high heat and if you're not using heat, you're going to have to use some kind of cold sterilant that requires extended exposure and is most often highly toxic. So uh, endospores are really tough to get rid of. Protozoan cysts and oocysts, they can be removed through filtration or boiling. So heat works again, works great. If uh, we can't heat it, then we can, of course, filter it. So water parks, areas where kids are running around in water, those water systems will go through a filtration system as well as a chlorination system in order to get rid of oocysts. Uh, oocysts from protozoan, that's like your cryptosporidium, giardia, entamoeba, those are mostly gastrointestinal diseases. Uh, so young children that are in diapers in public water, they can be an issue. So filtration is really important. We can't boil that water. Uh, you don't have time for that. And uh, common charcoal filters and chlorination is ineffective against uh, cysts and oocysts. So any kind of public water park, public water facilities, there is always going to, there always should be some kind of filtration system. Then we have the mycobacteriums. The mycobacterium species, they, this is your tuberculosis. They require very high level disinfectants and uh, can even be destroyed by some cold sterilants. It usually requires pretty toxic chemicals. Some versions of commercial Lysol. We use commercial Lysol in the laboratory. They are anti-mycobacterial and anti-TB um, anti because mycobacterium is the uh, genre of bacteria that causes tuberculosis. Pseudomonas is a gram-negative rod. It does. There's nothing really special about it. Like mycobacterium, they have a, a mycolic acid on their cell wall, so they're very sticky and water resistant, they're uh, li basically liquid resistant, so that's what makes them difficult to destroy. But pseudomonas are just gram-negative rods. There's nothing crazy or special or making them resistant aside from the fact that they develop resistance very rapidly. And pseudomonas is not only anti, um, antimicrobial resistant, but it's also antibiotic resistant. So pseudomonas has become, over the past several years has become a very difficult organism to destroy and get rid of. One class of disinfectants we're going to talk about in a few slides are the uh, quaternary compounds. We call them quats for short. And you can, if pseudomonas is suspected to be in the environment in which you are trying to disinfect, like a surgical suite or somebody with a, a, a pseudomonal lung infection or uh, a burn unit because pseudomonas loves to infect burns. You cannot use a quaternary compound in those areas. Uh, Pseudomonas will literally grow in quaternary compounds, uh, and this can cause a very serious risk uh, of disease. Non-enveloped viruses are one of the easiest things to, to get rid of. Uh, viruses are just protein coats with genetic information inside of these protein little protein-made boxes, but Viruses come in two forms, non-enveloped and enveloped. And non-enveloped viruses are just the protein box. So they're a little bit more resistant. 
your enveloped viruses have a phospholipid bilayer on the outside of that box. And the, the viral spikes that these, these pathogens use to gain entry into our cells are located in that phospholipid membrane. So all we really have to do to make to neutralize those viruses is just get rid of the phospholipid membrane, and then we, we don't have any problem with those viruses uh, infecting. Non-enveloped viruses, the proteins can some t are oftentimes denatured by disinfectants, and we can get rid of those pretty quickly. Prions are the most difficult to get rid of of all pathogens. They require extremely high level, very specialized cold sterilants if you're going to use cold sterilization. Otherwise, incineration, direct heat or direct flame is the only way that's known and reliable to destroy prions. Then we get into the topic of how many organisms are you trying to destroy? Do you have a really high population of microorganisms or do you have a very low population? Uh, if you're cleaning your kitchen counter, you would not clean your kitchen counter the same way uh, every single time. You may come in and after doing the dishes and that, you wipe the counters down with a, some Lysol spray or a, a bleach wipe and you're good to go. That's fine. But if you were cutting up raw chicken or raw beef and some of the fluid got on the countertop, you're going to change, you're going to clean that very differently because of the number of microorganisms that may now be present. So we have to take that into consideration. And there's um, a method used by the canning industry, actually, that uh, many places use to determine if they're destroying microorganisms. So in the canning industry, they use something called a D value. This is known as a DRT or decimal reduction time. And it's written as D with the sub temperature and that's called the D value, that will be equal to how many minutes it takes at that temperature to destroy 90% of the population of the bacteria. Now remember, this is the canning industry, not necessarily the healthcare industry. So they're looking at disinfecting or pasteurization. This is more of a pasteurization type process. So how long do we have to apply this specific temperature to our specimens in order to destroy any to destroy the 90% of the microbial population that may be present. So the example we have here on the slide is if it took three minutes to destroy 90% of 100,000 spore population at 120 degrees Celsius. This is written as D sub 120 equals three. As a D value decreases, a temperature oftentimes increases. So as your D value goes down, your temperature goes up. Now, in addition to a D value, the canning industry also uses something called a Z value. And in the Z value, we're measuring the change in the death rate with a change in temperature. So we're really, the Z value is almost just kind of looking at the slope of the line. If you look at the graphs to the right, the first graph on the left is showing D value. And the second graph on the right is showing a Z value. And the Z value is measuring temperature changes, uh, and it's really just a measurement of the slope of the line or a rate. Now we have heat and heat is the most common form of microbial control because it is so efficient. Efficiency in this is known as efficacy. Uh, reliable, it's super reliable and believe it or not, f uh, open flame and using heat incineration is actually very safe. But we do have different types of heat. We have moist heat, which uh, causes the denaturation of proteins. It causes our proteins to kind of either fold really tight or just kind of fall apart. Moist heat includes boiling, pasteurization, and autoclaving. Autoclaving is uh, steam under pressure. It's a big, giant pressure cooker. And the point in autoclaving, uh, like you saw in the video I showed earlier, with the autoclaving, you have to make sure that everything comes into contact with the steam. So it's important. Then we have dry heat. Dry heat kills uh, cells and denatures proteins, just like moist heat does. And the forms of dry heat we have are incineration, which is direct burning. And there are types of ovens called dry ovens. And dry ovens will, um, will also kill. They're not quite as effective as the direct flame, but they do work well for powders and other items that can't uh, be exposed to water. 
Filtration, we already covered. You saw the video on the, the filtration method. Feel free to go back and watch it again if you want to. Uh, that's liquid filtration. Uh, an interesting aspect is air filtration. In air filtration, that's what HEPA filters do. Right? So we hear all about HEPA filters in our air conditioning systems, in HEPA filters in our car air conditioning, all those sorts of things. So autoclaving. Autoclaving is the gold standard in sterilization. And in the top left there, you can see how an autoclave works. Put your That's just growth media in there, but we fill up a pressurized chamber with steam. And why do we apply steam under pressure? Because normally water would turn to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, but now we want to heat that water up. It'll become steam at that point, but we want the steam to be even hotter. So the hotter it is, the more effective it is. And we know that we can destroy populations of bacteria at 121 degrees Celsius as opposed to 100. But we have to, in order to maintain that temperature for an extended period of time, we of course now we have to uh, apply this under pressure. So that's why an autoclave is just really a great big pressure cooker. When autoclaving, something to keep in mind, um, whatever is going to be sterilized has to come into contact with steam. This is why surgical packs are wrapped in cotton and cloth, because if they were wrapped in plastic, the plastic is impenetrable to the steam. But if we wrap them in cloth, then the steam is able to, to um, pass into the cloth and autoclaving will be effective. In the commercial canning industry, they use gigantic autoclaves known as industrial autoclaves or retorts. And retorts hold multitudes of cans and they heat, they autoclave or they heat up, really they kind of boil. Think about uh, when somebody wants to sterilize baby bottles, they, they boil the bottles. So it's used to ensure the destruction, however, of a very specific organism known as C. botulinum. And Clostridium botulinum is a gram-positive endospore forming rod. So it's the organism that causes botulism. And endospores, as we know, are extremely difficult to get rid of. Uh, canned foods are going to be sterilized in a manner known as commercial sterilization. In commercial sterilization, there are sometimes a couple endospores that are referred to as thermophilic. They may be able to survive the heat that's um, being applied in the retort. Environmental factors can also play a role in... Uh, if they're canning vegetables from one farm that has a higher microbial count in its soil than another farm, there could be a very a much higher microbial count in a specific crop. We also have to take into consideration what is it that's being canned. Are we looking at spam or some kind of canned meat? Or are we looking at vegetables or fruit, something like that? So again, environment and what it is you're going to, um, what it is you're going to sterile sterilizes or can is, is important. All right, filtration. I showed you the video a little earlier on the filtration method, but I just wanted to kind of drive home the point that in, in filtration, there are different levels of it, right? So we have microfiltration, ultrafiltration, uh, MF, UF, NF, nanofiltration, and, all, and then of course reverse osmosis. And all of these different filtration methods are based on the pore size of the actual filter itself. So if you take a look at this quick chart here, we actually get all the way down, we can get rid of um, regular particles, which is usually what uh, microfiltration will do. We don't get rid of bacteria until we get down to the ultrafiltration rate. Viruses are considered filterable. So we can filter out viruses. This is usually done with either ultrafiltration or with nano. And then once we get down to the, uh, down to the ion level and uh, both multi and monovalent ions, now we're looking at reverse osmosis. So here we have um, particles that can be respirated, meaning they can be inhaled. And this is why in HEPA filters, they wanna use certain pore sizes. And HEPA filters are different. 
not only are they thicker and they're a finer pore size, it requires more airflow to move through a HEPA filter. However, HEPA filters also are what are referred to as continuous filters, meaning there are no gaps in between any of the filter papers within the actual HEPA cartridge itself. So there is nowhere for any type of particle to get through that HEPA filter except for the air that it's, it's um, pushing through. Irradiation. Irradiation is actually becoming a more and more common form of disinfectant. Now, irradiation, there are, there are two types, ionizing and non-ionizing. Microwaves are also considered a form of irradiation, but they work a little bit differently. So in ionizing uh, irradiation, this one is actually quite dangerous. Uh, it causes direct cellular damage. It bumps around and just breaks down DNA. Uh, indirect damage can be caused by the formation of res uh, uh, reactive oxygen species molecules. Forms of ionizing radiation you may have heard of are gamma rays and uh, x-rays. One of the problems with uh, ionizing irradiation is it's not always effective against endospores. If endospores are what you're trying to get rid of, you have to expose them to gamma or x-rays for a long period of time, and this can, of course, be dangerous. Non-ionizing radiation is not as dangerous. And with non-ionizing radiation, UV light of a very specific wavelength called a germicidal wavelength, anywhere between about 210, 220 nanometers to uh, 300. This wavelength can actually cross the peptidoglycan and these uh, wavelengths of UV light bump into the DNA of the bacteria. When they do this, they cause adenines to be converted into thymine. So A gets turned into T, which means in the intact DNA molecule, we now introduce genetic mutations. And genetic mutations will start to build up. The longer the exposure to the UV light, the greater the genetic mutations. The greater the genetic mutations, the more likely the organism is not going to be able to survive. Uh, one of the issues with non-ionizing radiation, it is, it is only effective on the surface of things. So it doesn't pass through glass. It doesn't plas pass through plastic. Um, it has to actually come into contact with the surface, kind of like steam in an autoclave. Uh, both ionizing and non-ionizing irradiation, however, have become really big in the food industry. And the food industry uses it because they can disinfect, they can wash fruits and vegetables. And when they, they send the fruits and vegetables oftentimes through a dryer, they'll expose the, um, they'll expose the fruit and vegetables to some type of UV light. Now, other industries, they may be packaging stuff in boxes. They're going to use more of gamma rays uh, or x-rays. They'll run the box through the x-ray and that will disinfect everything inside the box. So I've got a, a quick video I'll show you in a second. Another one I talk, want to talk about are microwaves. Microwaves are really safe, but they don't destroy the, the microorganism directly. They actually heat up water molecules and the heat from the water molecules causes the, um, any microorganisms to be destroyed. One of the problems with microwaves, however, is since it doesn't pass through everything at the same level, if things are unevenly cut or distributed in a microwave, you can have um, things not being cooked properly. Down in the right-hand corner, that little symbol you see there, the green flower-looking symbol, if you look around in your grocery store, sometimes you will see that symbol, and that means that the food has been sanitized using irradiation. That's the uh, universal irradiation symbol. All right, so chemical methods. Uh, when we start looking at chemical methods, uh, remember these methods are not quite as reliable as heat, but they are quite effective. And they're very, they're most effective on surfaces and materials that may be heat resistant. That's usually why you're going to use a chemical method. Uh, they do react irreversible, uh, irreversibly with cell components. And what this means is that they, um, once you've applied a disinfectant or a sterilant, you can't reverse the effects of it. You can't bring, bring whatever it killed, you can't bring it back. Um, chemical methods can be used for either disinfecting or sterilizing. So some, some chemical compounds are, are called sterilants. And sterilants will kill 
bacteria, viruses, and endospores. Um, they re usually require long-term exposure, even up to several hours, and they're used for heat-sensitive equipment and surfaces in areas that can't necessarily be autoclaved. Uh, High-level disinfectants will destroy viruses and living microorganisms or, or active, veget what we call vegetative microbes. They're not very effective against endospores, so you want to be careful with those. Intermediate disinfectants are those destroy vegetative bacteria and mycobacteria. Low-level disinfectants, of course, are just going to destroy vegetative bacteria, some viruses and fungi. They're not usually effective against mycobacteria or even um, unenveloped viruses and endospores. Selection standards. When selecting a disinfectant for a particular situation, think about a few things first. Toxicity is do I need this strong of an antiseptic or this strong of a disinfectant? Uh, will something milder that's not necessarily toxic be just as effective? Uh, you're not going to want to clean your bathroom with the nitric, uh, the, the nitric acid sterilant that's used to clean in the micro lab. I mean, that would, that's just not, you don't want to expose yourself to that on a regular basis. Is organic matter present? I don't want to neutralize it. Uh, we talked about that a few slides ago. Compatibility with the material. Again, sometimes sterilants are so toxic or so uh, nasty, they can, they can melt something. They can melt plastic. Some can even melt some glass. Are they going to leave a residue? You don't want to leave a residue behind because if people are going to come into contact with that surface, uh, then the residue that's on the surface could possibly be harmful. How expensive is it? Is it so expensive it's ridiculous for us to even in purchase that particular one? Um, is it available? Can I even get it? Some sterilants and, and cleaning chemical or sterilant compounds require a specialized license for a healthcare facility to be able to purchase those. Uh, can I store it? We're talking about some pretty hardcore chemicals here. So storage can be an issue. Is it going to remain stable? Is it going to give off gases? Is it going, as it ages, it's, is its half-life going to cause it to turn into something else? Those are things to consider. And what is the environmental risk? How expensive is this sterilant to get to dispose of? How am I going to get rid of it without harming the environment if I'm using these really toxic chemicals? Mechanisms of action. An MOA or a mechanism of action is how something works. What does it do? What's its mechanism that makes it work? And in disinfectants, we have a couple of different MOAs or mechanisms of action of different uh, uh, compounds. Some compounds are going to destroy the cell wall. We break down peptidoglycan in the cell wall. The cell's not really going to survive. Some are going to destroy the plasma membrane. If we break down the plasma membrane, we're going to disrupt things like cellular respiration, electron transport chains. We're going to uh, allow, now we have just kind of crazy diffusion in that across the cell wall. Uh, destroying the plasma membrane, cell contents might even leak out. Inactivating proteins. If our compound inactivates proteins, then the cell's not going to be able to carry out its regular day-to-day -day functions. Others uh, can destroy or mutate genetic material. We saw that with the irradiation. Uh, and then we start mutating genetic material, then uh, the organism's not going to be able to survive. It won't be able to produce uh, proteins that would be effective. Then we have disruption of transport systems. And disruption of transport systems also includes the creation of export systems. So when we disrupt transport systems, this means that we can't get, um, can't get the right materials into the cell and the cell can't get waste products out. But they do sometimes create, Pseudomonas does this, they'll create a form, a type of transport system known as an efflux pump. And an efflux pump is a small protein that will pump out compounds faster than um, or as fast as them coming in. So pseudomonas will literally pump out a disinfectant as the disinfectant is moving into the cell so that it can't actually come into contact with whatever it is it's going to destroy. That brings us to the different classes of chemical control. We have first the alcohols. 
Alcohols denature proteins, break down lipids. But one of the characteristics about alcohol, besides being painful on open wounds, is that it can actually promote infection when used in the wrong environment. Now, we use alcohol to clean the skin before drawing blood or giving a shot, those sorts of things. And on intact skin, alcohol is fine. But on a wound, uh, it, first off, if you pour alcohol on it, it's going to hurt like crazy. But the second is alcohol, its MOA is the denaturation of proteins. So when alcohol comes into contact with these proteins on, in open wounds, it's going to cause these proteins to kind of stick together and they form kind of a, a film on top of the wound. And then that film on top of the wound can actually promote infection as opposed to fight it. So alcohol is never used on, on open flesh uh, or open wounds. It's used strictly only on uh, intact skin. Aldehydes are a class of disinfectants that will denature proteins as well as break down genetic material. These are your formaldehydes, and there's another one called a glutaraldehyde, and uh, they usually require long exposure against endospores. Biguanides break down cell membranes. Uh, these are your common uh, face cleansers, antiseptic type cleansers. Pseudomonas is resistant to biguanides. Ethylene oxide is actually a gaseous sterilant. Um, uh, it reacts with proteins and it is very effective against endospores. The spore coats are permeable to gases. Other classes of chemical control include the halogens. And in the halogens, we have proteins um, that get denatured, other cell components, chlorine and chlorine bleach are known skin irritants. You can't use them on skin, but they are very effective and fairly inexpensive. Then there's iodine. Iodine is, does not work against endospores, but it's safe for um, like an iodine tincture. It's safe to use on the skin. Uh, usually it's, it's diluted uh, and it works using um, iodophores. All right, another class of chemical control are metals. Uh, there's not a whole lot of metals that are used. Uh, silver is the most common. And uh, uh, metals work by combining the metal ions will actually combine with sul sulfhydryl groups. And this process is known as oligodynamic activity. Now, you won't see the term oligodynamic activity in your textbook, but I'm just going to let you know there is a question on the exam that specifically asks, about the mechanism of action of metals. And the only correct answer is oligodynamic activity. So if you watched this lecture, you are lucky enough to get one free answer for exam one. Uh, examples of metals are silver impregnated dressings. Metals were very effective against pseudomonas. So many burn patients, when they have um, large burns and they wrap the burns, they will use silver impregnated dressing because uh, pseudomonas is a very common infectious organism in burns, causes burns to get infected. And it, silver is very effective against it. So these silver dressings are used to, um, to dress burn patients to prevent pseudomonas infections. Also, silver antibiotic drops are used in the, eye born, in the eyes of newborns when uh, when they're first when they're first born, in order to prevent any disease in the eye, they or a bacteria in the eye that they may have picked up during um, during birth when they're traveling through the birth canal. Ozone causes oxidation and uh, is an alternative for water disinfecting. Peroxygens are also oxidizers. Uh, they're pretty safe in low concentrations, but not so safe in high concentrations. Phenolics are a very broad class of uh, antimicrobial chemicals, and they function by breaking down membranes and, of course, denaturing proteins. They, in really low concentrations, they can be safe for use on skin. And they were one of the very first germicides introduced into the commercial market. This is, uh, phenolics are the most common, um, common disinfectants put in household products like soaps, lotions, dish soaps, just about, you can find just about anything antimicrobial these days. Uh, it's very common commercially. Quaternary compounds are soaps. They are very cheap and pretty effective. 
Uh, they're used in a lot of different cleaning products. And one of the problems with quats, though, they're not really used in, uh, in healthcare facilities because Pseudomonas is highly resistant to it. 